Welcome to the Gray Area Podcast presented by Aura. My name is Kevin Gray, Mavericks pre and post game host on 97 One The Freak on the Dallas Mavericks Radio Network. Appreciate you joining me here on the Gray Area. Make sure you download and subscribe to the podcast to give it a five star rating wherever you get your podcast for free. And if you're watching this on my YouTube channel, like and comment on the video. And make sure you follow me on Twitter at Kevin Gray Sports. On this Friday episode of the Gray Area Podcast, the Cowboys and Dak Prescott need to quit playing games. The Mavericks are looking like real threats in the West. And the Texas Rangers got to find a little more swag. But first, it's always drama when it comes to the Dallas Cowboys. And this week was no different as the Cowboys get ready to move on from a terrible March into April as the Cowboys didn't do much of anything during free agency, but the biggest news of this particular week as the star turns is the fact that Dak Prescott and the Cowboys are quote-unquote on the same page, but at the same time, it doesn't look like a contract extension for the quarterback is imminent. And of course, Dak Prescott going into the ninth year of his Cowboys career will be entering the final year of his four-year $160 million contract that will see him be a free agent potentially after the end of the 2024 season, if they don't get a contract extension done, to which has a lot of Cowboys fans up in arms, most of which who want to see the quarterback still with the Cowboys, some of which who are ready to see Dak move on. That was, of course, he only has a two and five playoff record so far as quarterback of America's team. But at the same time, it gives you a window into just how pathetic this offseason has been. And we're not even out of March yet. After the Cowboys lost their longtime left tackle and Tyron Smith, Tyler Biotis moved on to Washington. Tony Pollard moved on to Tennessee. It's been a dismal offseason for this Cowboys, and they could have found themselves getting some relief if they had decided to get a contract done with Dak Prescott. But as it stands right now, and by the way, I encourage you to listen to the episode that I had with the Athletics' John Machota earlier this week, it appears that the Cowboys and Dak Prescott are no closer to getting a deal done anytime soon, which means we could be talking about this until we get to training camp in July and into August and maybe even before the regular season starts, to which I say, as I put a pin in that conversation for a quick second, if I'm Dak Prescott, by the time I get to the beginning of the regular season, I'm not talking contract with the Cowboys, my focus would be solely on trying to help this team do something that it hasn't done for nearly three decades, which is get to an NFC championship game and try to get to a Super Bowl, because I wouldn't want that distraction necessarily with all the other ones that already come with being the Dallas Cowboys quarterback to be a part of the narrative, even though on the outside, it would be all of the talk of the national media and local otherwise when it comes to Dak Prescott's contract. But that's another conversation for another day. If I'm Dak Prescott and the Cowboys, they're clearly playing a game of chicken, which I don't necessarily appreciate, especially knowing that this team has got to find a way to get improved by the time we begin the 2024 NFL season. Because let's think about it from both sides here. If you'll walk down this road with me, walk with me, Elias. The Cowboys could say, look, you're two and five in your playoff career with the Cowboys. And while, yes, you have a no tag and a no trade clause, we know that there isn't a situation better than the one outside of here that you would want to go to to try and be a quarterback, no matter how much money you get from your next team. Because, Dak, if you're listening and you're thinking about it, if you're Jerry and Steven Jones, are you really trying to go to the AFC and battle Patrick Mahomes? Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Tua Tonga Bailoa, Justin Herbert, just to name a few, to try and battle your way through the AFC to win a Super Bowl championship, knowing that you're at the age of 30, 31 years old, and time would be of the essence to try and get you a championship. I don't think Dak is necessarily trying to go to the AFC to have to deal with Patrick Mahomes for the next decade because the way that Mahomes is winning Super Bowls right now he's not going to be done winning them anytime soon. And if you're Dak Prescott and you look at your situation, Jerry and Steven could say, look, if you stay here in the NFC, you're arguably, and actually you are the best quarterback in the NFC right now. The second best is most likely Jalen Hurts, and you know how much he struggled last year, and you've seen some of the issues that the Eagles have had. They just traded Hassan Reddick over to the New York Jets. And I know that they signed Saquon Barkley, but they also lost Fletcher Cox 
and Jason Kelsey. So the Eagles have had an up and down off season so far. So if you're the Cowboys, you say, well, yeah, you may have a lot of the leverage here, but we also have one big piece of leverage ourselves. And that's the idea that you won't find a better situation than where you would be if you stay with the Dallas Cowboys, which is a pretty damn good point. If you're Jerry and Steven Jones, not to say that that would be a reason why you would try to lowball the quarterback in order to have him take a hometown discount to stay with the Cowboys because he should not. Because here's a note, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen of all ages. No player should take less than what he's worth to help the team manage their cap. It's not the player's job to manage the salary cap for his football team in this case. And if your Dak Prescott, CeeDee Lamb, Micah Parsons, the job of any player is to get what they're worth, even if it means resetting the market, because it's not necessarily about the player who's getting the contract. It's about the next person who gets the next contract, who has an opportunity to make even more money because that other person didn't take less to set the other player up to have to deal with a team that says, hey, Dak Prescott took less, Micah Parsons took less, CeeDee Lamb took less. No, the responsibility of the player is to get as much as they're worth, especially in a sport where you participate in car crashes for 18 games at a time or 18 weeks at a time in 17 games, however hell the many games that they play these days. The point is Dak Prescott's in position to set him up for success for a long time by getting exactly what he's worth. But then if you're Dak Prescott on the other side, what incentive do you have to get a deal done right now? Because if you look at it from Dak Prescott's perspective, at this point, he's going into year nine of his career with the Cowboys. He has a chance to enter free agency and arguably be the best quarterback to ever hit free agency in the year 2025. I don't care that he has a two and five playoff record. I don't care that he hasn't made an NFC championship game. I don't care that Cowboys fans feel like they could do better by moving on from Dak Prescott, to which I say that's not true either. Because do you really think that the Cowboys are in position now or later to find themselves a better quarterback than what they have in one rain to cut a Prescott right now? The answer is hell no, they're not. And for all those who say, Kevin, I'm tired of the Dak or nobody conversation, think about what could be hitting the free agent market going into 2025, and you think the Cowboys would be willing to pay top dollar outside of Dak Prescott to bring in another quarterback, and they won't be bad enough to be able to draft a quarterback who you think could change the fortunes of this team and be better than the quarterback that's gotten them to this point where they've won 36 games over the last three years. The point is Dak Prescott could say, you know what? Tired of all this around here. Yes, I love being a Dallas Cowboy. I love putting the star on the side of my helmet. But at the same time, there are greener pastures on the other side that are outside of this when it comes to the Cowboys. And he would, yes, boys and girls, would become the highest paid quarterback in the history of the National Football League. We just watched Kirk Cousins, who's about to be 36 years old, get $100 million guaranteed from the Atlanta Falcons to be their quarterback of the future. You don't think Dak Prescott is going to get a contract bigger than that if he hits the open market? And if you do, and if you don't, you're kidding yourself. Dak Prescott would have a bidding war on his hands if he were to hit unfettered free agency in 2025. And that's the risk that the Dallas Cowboys and the dangerous game that they're playing with this quarterback. So while yes, Jerry and Steven may say, Dak, there is no better situation than here with the Cowboys for you have a chance to win a Super Bowl and the notoriety that comes with winning a championship. Dak can look at them right back in the face and say, I have a no tag, no trade clause, and the chance to hit free agency to become the highest paid player in the history of the National Football League. And I could do that somewhere else. And damn, winning a championship for this team because of all the headache that you have put me through over the last nine years. And you say, Kevin, what headache has that been? The headache of that he and still about to be in year nine having to prove to the Cowboys that he's worth being the franchise quarterback when he just finished top two in the league in MVP voting. I don't know what more proof that you need outside of obviously winning a championship that's needed to prove that he's a franchise quarterback. He just led the NFL in touchdown passes this past season. He cut down on the turnovers, which everyone, including myself, wanted him to do. He flourished under Mike McCarthy in the offense, and he did everything that he possibly could 
again outside of winning a championship that would give you confidence that this dude is still pretty damn good at football and would be the best quarterback available to be able to help this franchise try to get to a Super Bowl. But all of that doesn't necessarily matter for a lot of Cowboys fans who just want to see something different. It's like at times when you're in a relationship, it's not that your relationship is going bad necessarily, but it's sometimes that you just need a change. You need something different. You need somebody else to make you feel good or help you be better than what you already are. And maybe Cowboys fans feel like the relationship that they've had with Dak Prescott doesn't serve them anymore. You might want to be careful because Dak Prescott may feel like the relationship for him and the Cowboys doesn't serve him anymore, which may leave the Cowboys in purgatory which we know they don't necessarily want to be when it comes to their quarterback. So be careful when trying to get a divorce from your current relationship and your partner. Maybe you might need to go to counseling. Maybe you might need to figure it out a little bit to try and figure out some things to help your relationship get better. But leaving the person of one way or the other may not be the best idea. In fact, you know what? Don't take my word for it. Hear Ryan Clark and what he has to say from ESPN on how the Cowboys and Dak Prescott might want to figure it out. And this example here gives you a better idea. And also, like, this is the end. Like, let me try to paint a more clear picture for people who don't necessarily get locked into contracts and footballs and quarterbacks and those sorts of things, right? Like when you're an organization, you can play the field at the quarterback position. You can have three of them on the roster sometimes, two of them on the roster sometimes. You can draft one this year. You can draft one that year. It's like a single man who's going to college at LSU. He could just live it up and date who he wants. But at some point, he's going to decide that he wants a wife, right? And the Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. It's the same thing in football. He who finds finds a quarterback, finds a, finds good, a good thing. thing. And so when you get that quarterback and you lock into that marriage and that is your person, you are never going to sit at home and one day and tell your person, you can go be on The Bachelorette. I don't I love go. you enough to lock you in. You ain't going to tell Stace, go on The Bachelorette. Dan ain't going to tell Tiff to go on The Bachelorette. I ain't going to be like Yonk, go on The Bachelorette because we want them. <laughs> Jerry Jones has said that next year we're going to let you go on the bachelorette because I can do bad all by myself. <laughs> and so when you look at this team, not only are we saying you have to go out and play a certain way, win a certain amount of games, get us to a certain point for us to keep you. We are also not going to give you the necessary tools to do so. We are essentially giving you a job, giving you a task that we are not equipping you to be able to do. So what does that say? We're going to get to the end of the season, and Dak Prescott is going to be somewhere else. Mike McCarthy is going to be back at home studying analytics for the next job. <laughs> He's going to lie and wear pajamas to get. That's where we're headed. Jammies. So... Let's not in no way at any point, Greeny, you're not going to get me and Dan to do it on any Monday at any point in this season. Are we talking about Cowboys Super Bowl aspirations? So you see the Cowboys and Dak Prescott, they need to figure this out because no one in this situation needs to find themselves, especially Dak Prescott, testing the open market to see if somebody else wants to date and commit to Dak Prescott. You found your person. Commit to them and move on if you're the Dallas Cowboys. But no, as the star turns, the drama continues to be a part of this franchise for no damn good reason. And yet here we are with the Cowboys and Dak Prescott in a stalemate and a standoff. No matter how much they say that they're, quote unquote, on the same page with one another, it feels chaotic and disorganized from the outside looking in. And maybe it doesn't matter. It should be up to the Cowboys and Dak Prescott to figure all this out. And from the outside looking in, while it looks disorganized, dysfunctional, chaotic, whatever metaphor or word you want to use to describe how pathetic this offseason has been for the Cowboys, maybe they know what they're doing all along. And maybe Dak Prescott is sitting there thinking, you know what? Yeah, let the Cowboys play this game and watch me play a game of my own because I've heard that two can play that game. And Dak Prescott may be the second one in this particular scenario that looks around and says, you know what? Game over. And the Cowboys could be looking for another quarterback in the future. But all this to say is I'm tired of it. 
get it done and figure it out. Otherwise, if I'm Dak, yeah, I'm moving on. I'll find another way to win a championship with another team, and it doesn't serve me anymore to get this done or try to get this done in Dallas, to which I say, if you're Jerry and Steven Jones, good luck with that because you're going to need it. Let's take a break here on the Gray Area Podcast. We'll hear from today's sponsor of our video and our podcast, and let's hear from Aura. Today's video is brought to you by Aura. Do a Google search on your name and email address to see how much information comes up about you. I was devastated by the amount of information that I could be seeing searching my name and profile, and I knew then I needed to be protected for not just myself, but also for my family. Data brokers sell your information to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, your relatives, it's all out there. That's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. Cleaning up my information not only helps reduce the amount of spam I get, but it protects me from hackers who could use this information to help them access my social media accounts, bank accounts, and other sensitive information. Aura also does so much more to protect me and my family from online threats that I can't see. It's really easy to set up, so I don't have to download several different apps to get things like antivirus, VPN, password management, parental controls, identity theft insurance, and more. I get everything at one affordable price. You may already have one of these tools already, but not having Aura is like locking the front door and leaving the back door wide open. Aura is always on, doing the hard work to protect me and my family so I can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. I value my privacy and I value yours. You can go to Aura.com slash Kevin Gray to start your two-week free trial. Please see the link in the description. Back here on the Gray Area Podcast. Again, thank you to Aura for the sponsor of today's video and our podcast. Make sure you click the link in the description and be able to check out Aura there. The Gray Area Podcast, of course, you can find on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts for free. And you can find the Dallas Mavericks streaking right now in the Western Conference. As of us having this conversation right now, the Mavericks have won nine of their last 10 games, a season-high 14 games above 500 as they continue their five-game road trip. They got a game tonight on Friday before they continue their road trip against the Houston Rockets and the Golden State Warriors before they come back home for three straight home games as they play the final 10 games of the regular season. And the Mavericks are playing their best basketball at the right time. And Luka Doncic, boys and girls, has found himself climbing up to number two in NBA.com's MVP ladder, to which I say Luka's got an outside shot here of more than an outside shot of one of the NBA's MVP, while Nikola Jokic, yes, is the leader in the clubhouse right now. For the number one seed at Denver Nuggets, Luca is hot on his heels, especially the way that the Mavericks have been playing ever since the beginning of February. This team, 17 and six in the last 23 games, top five in offensive rating, top 10 in defensive rating, one of the best in terms of net rating over that time at a nut, nearly plus eight during their last 23 games. And Luca and Kyrie are putting on an absolute show. You saw the beatdown they put on Sacramento on Tuesday by 36 points. The Mavericks hitting 22 three-pointers, shooting over 55% from three and from the field, and they have been devastatingly good in the paint with Derek Lively and Daniel Gafford patrolling the middle. And now P.J. Washington's got the nerve to start hitting three-pointers himself and Tim Hardaway Jr., both of them combined it to hit eight of the 22 threes that the Mavericks had in the game against Sacramento. All that to say is they're finding different ways to win games, and the question is now going forward, are they truly Western Conference threats given this newfound defense that they're playing and the fact that they're starting to knock down shots, at least it was on Tuesday, and what that means for the rest of the regular season? Because if this is the Mavericks team that we're going to see for the remainder of the season, they are legitimately – a Western Conference threat because you think about what's going on with some of these teams here. Yeah, the Denver Nuggets are the reigning NBA champions. They have Nikola Jokic, Jamal Murray, though, dealing with a little bit of injury. Oklahoma City feels like it may be fading a little bit down the stretch. And yes, Shea Gilgis-Alexander is going to be a first-team All-NBA selection. Again, 
the youth and the experience of Oklahoma City doesn't necessarily give you confidence that they would be the ones to find themselves getting to the Western Conference Finals or toward the NBA Finals, at least this year. Minnesota is dealing with injury right now with Carl Anthony Towns, and yes, they've been really good defensively, and Anthony Edwards is a star. You may feel like a matchup between the Mavericks and the Wolves could favor the Mavericks, especially with their two big guys in the middle. The Los Angeles Clippers, yes, got a win the other night against the Philadelphia 76ers, but they've been fading fast with the aging group. That doesn't see PJ, Paul George, excuse me, with a contract extension in hand right now. And Kawhi Leonard, who, yes, did sign a contract extension, getting a little bit older as well. So when you look at the top four teams, you think, okay, well, yeah, Denver is the number one team. But the Mavericks, who have beaten the Nuggets, they've beaten the Thunder. We've seen them beat the Wolves as well. And we've seen the epic playoff series that the Mavericks have had with the Clippers over the last several years. You feel like the Mavericks could have a shot to get themselves to the Western Conference Finals. I hadn't even mentioned the New Orleans Pelicans who have been playing terrific ball. Willie Green, coach for the New Orleans Pelicans, is legitimate NBA coach of the year candidate. Zion Williamson has been playing well, but Brandon Ingram's dealing with injury himself and his status going forward for the rest of the year is going to be up in the air. And, of course, the Mavericks find themselves right now currently in sixth in the West. If the season ended today, they would be top six in the West, and they would have a matchup as it stands right now, looking at potentially the Minnesota Timberwolves or the Oklahoma City Thunder, depending on who finishes second or third there. Then, of course, you've got the Sacramento Kings and the Phoenix Suns, the Los Angeles Lakers, and the Golden State Warriors. And, oh, by the way, the Houston Rockets, who've won 10 straight games as of this conversation we're having right now. So the West has been devastatingly good this year, but if you look at the Mavericks and the way that they're defending – and the way that they're obviously going to continue to score with Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving leading the charge offensively, they will give any team problems. They have become the proverbial, you don't want to see that team in the first round or even in the second round of the Western Conference playoffs because they've got a dude who's going to be first team All-NBA for the fifth consecutive year, may sneak away and steal the MVP in the final 10 games of the season, and another sidekick, or I say a sidekick in Kyrie Irving, He's playing the best basketball that he's played in quite some time and is healthy in doing so for the Mavericks and has started to be really be veteran leader guy for this team. And, yes, they've got a two-headed monster at center who's combining for over 23 points per game, over 12 rebounds, three blocks per game, and Derek Lively and Daniel Gaffer, P.J. Washington's defending like crazy. And if he could find a consistent three-point shot down the stretch, this is another guy that can add some offense to this team. Tim Hardaway Jr. may be turning the corner. The point is here, the Mavericks are looking extremely dangerous, and their situation has become, Brian Windhorst, very interesting as this season has gone on. And when you talk to people and you look at what this team is doing, yeah, they're a legitimate threat. Because if you see a matchup between, let's say, the Mavericks and the Oklahoma City Thunder or the Mavericks and the Timberwolves in the first round, or if the Mavericks find themselves somehow, here's where we are. The Mavericks find themselves within striking distance of getting to the four seed and having home court advantage in the first round of the Western Conference playoffs, which is not something you and I would have thought of just a couple of weeks ago. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, you and I were trying to run Jason Kidd out of town as the head coach, and now there's talks, according to The Athletic, that the Jason Kidd is expecting to potentially get a contract extension at the end of this season, to which I say, uh, let's pump the brakes here for a second. The Mavericks are on a hell of a run right now, but at times this team has looked dismal defensively, and the times the bottom looked like it was about to drop out of it. But I give Jason Kidd his flowers right now because his team is playing extremely well and they're playing at a high level. But to talk contracts extension, whoo boy, let's relax on some of that. We've seen how it's ended in Brooklyn and Milwaukee. And yes, he's got a generational talent in Luka Doncic and someone in Kyrie Irving who ultimately respects him, not only to they share a birthday, but obviously those two are extremely close. Jason Kidd is in a much better situation than what he was in Brooklyn and Milwaukee, but to do contract extension, let's see how the rest of the season goes into the final 10 games and, of course, into the postseason before we start handing out contract extensions for Jason Kidd. But nonetheless, that just gives you an idea of where this team is relative to where they were 
just a season ago. Because let's think about it. Last year, this team was careening toward a 38-44 and record, finishing 11th in the West. Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving, injuries galore. They were only 5-15 and when they played together. Things were just terrible down the stretch last year. But now this team finds themselves 14 games above 500, playing the best basketball of the season and dominating individual teams, I should say, in terms of their points in the paint and their defense. Yes, their defense has been what's been turning this team around. And I'm looking forward to watching this team the rest of the season because when you look around at the West and you think about the Mavericks, they pose a real threat to anybody that they come across. Derek Lively and Daniel Gafford dunking the hell out of the basketball. In fact, since the trade deadline, no teams had more dunks in the NBA than the Dallas Mavericks, including that 18-night dunk fest that they had against the Utah Jazz. Daniel Gafford had 10 of those by himself. So they're winning in a variety of ways. They are led by a monster superstar in Luka Doncic, who at 25 years old, is putting together one of the best careers already that we've ever seen. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, he's going to be first-team All-NBA for the fifth consecutive year. I'm trying to think, and I'll have to do a little bit more research on some of the best starts in terms of NBA careers because he's right up there with them in terms of what he's been able to do. Well, yes, he hasn't made an NBA Finals yet. He's already taken this team to a surprise Western Conference Final run a couple of years ago. And if he can take them even further or get back to that point, this year, that will be a huge step forward for this team because that's the thing I want to leave you with when it comes to the Mavericks in our conversation today. No matter what happens this year, especially if this team finds themselves making a deep playoff run, maybe toward the Western Conference Finals, they put themselves and set themselves up for a really bright future for this team. And that is not something that you or I could say just a year ago. But with the additions of Derek Lively, the athleticism that they have with Derek Jones Jr., Daniel Gafford, and what they've been able to put together, this team looks much more set up for the future comfortably than they did a year ago. And you give Nico Harrison credit for the ability to put this team together and continuously take swings to get them to this point because you look around at the West, and these teams are dangerously good. Denver. Oklahoma City, who is set up for the next decade with SGA leading the charge there with young talent and guys like Chet Holmgren, Jalen Williams that are there as well. Guys are going to be around for a long time for that team. Obviously, the nucleus that the Minnesota Timberwolves have put together with Rudy Gobert, Carl Anthony Towns, and budding superstar Anthony Edwards, well coached by Chris Finch there in Minnesota. You know what you've seen from the likes of the Denver Nuggets and what they've got going on with Nikola Jokic moving forward for a long time there with Jamal Murray, probably the best duo in the league with their abilities to put pressure on defenses offensively with Nikola Jokic being the offensive hub that he is. So all this to say is these teams are set up really well. And yes, Zion Williamson and the Pelicans look really good as well. And they're set up pretty nicely. We'll see how that works out down the future contractually when it comes to CJ McCollum, Brandon Ingram, and Zion Williams, if they can keep that nucleus together there in New Orleans, or if they decide to or not. But this sets up well for the Mavericks, not just for the rest of the season, but beyond 2024. And that is the that was, I thought, the goal for them this year. Find a way to chart a new path forward with consistency and being better defensively. And over the last 23 games, they've done just that. And now they've set themselves up to be a legitimate Western Conference threat as we go through the final 10 games of the season. But as they finish up this five-game road trip, as I mentioned, Friday against Sacramento, then they take on Houston, then Golden State. They're going to be playing some teams down the stretch. they got a lot to play for. Houston, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, they won 10 straight. Jalen Green's turning himself into a star, and Emi Odoka's had this team playing pretty good defense all season, but now they're putting it together offensively, and they are now on the heels of the Golden State Warriors, who can't keep Draymond Green in a game for more than four minutes at a time, apparently, after getting tossed the other night against the Orlando Magic. And the visible frustration, real quick, the visible frustration that you saw on Stephen Curry's face says that he is a man who is sick and tired of the BS that comes with the Draymond Green experience because my man lost it emotionally. And while, yeah, Golden State was able to rally and put it together to win that game, I can only imagine 
how sick and tired and frustrated Stephen Curry is of having to deal with this dude night in and night out, no matter how integral he is to winning basketball games. At some point, it may not be worth the headache, but it was for Golden State because they signed into a contract extension already for $100 million. So again, good luck with that if you're Golden State. But shout out to the Dallas Mavericks. They're balling right now, playing extremely well. And I cannot wait to watch the final 10 games of this season to see what they can do. Because if it's anything like we've seen over the last 23 games, you might want to buckle up because it's going to be a hell of a ride for the rest of the season and into the postseason for Luka Doncic and the Dallas Mavericks. Before I get out of here today, we've seen the return of Major League Baseball opening day taking place on Thursday. And, of course, the reigning World Series champion Texas Rangers took the field. They were able to get a walk-off win over the Chicago Cubs, where, of course, Craig Council, the highest-paid manager in the history of Major League Baseball, making to the tune of $8 million per season to manage the Chicago Cubs, lost his debut with Chicago, thanks to Jonah Heim, who was able to redeem himself after my man what let go of what was called a pass ball, although it was a foul ball. Didn't go after the ball, and the Cubs were able to score to take the lead, but Travis Jankowski bailed him out late in the game, getting a solo shot, and then eventually setting up Jonah Heim to be the hero to knock in the game winner as the Rangers get to celebrate, uh, got to celebrate, I should say, on opening night with the 4-3 to three win, setting off what hopefully will be another fantastic spring and summer for a ball club that surprised a lot of teams and surprised really all of Major League Baseball on their run to their first ever World Series championship in franchise history that took 63 years in the making. But I'll get to more of that here in a second. Let's stop down real quick, boys and girls, uh, on the uh, championship celebration. Now, it was cool, obviously, for all these dudes to be able to get out there and celebrate with their friends and their family, get their names called and recognize this, that, and third. Now, when we got to the unveiling of the uh, championship banner that was uh, revealed in right field, uh, that left a lot to be a desire. Not going to lie to you, because somebody now here's the thing. They revealed this banner uh, over right field, and it just was the World Series championship, World Series champions 2023, the Texas Rangers logo uh, on a white sheet. And that was it. Just the white sheet with the logo on there. That's still wrinkly and still needs to be unfolded a little bit. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. The point being, hey, man, somebody thought it was real hot to say, hey, you know what? Let's do this. Let, let's do this. Here we go. Here we go. Let's put the World Series trophy and the logo with the Texas Rangers 2023 on a giant, huge white bed sheet and hang it over right field. Let's do that. What do you, what do you guys think about that? And somebody else was like, you know what? That's a damn good idea. And then someone else was like, you know what? That really is a good idea. Let's do that. And next thing you know, that's what's hanging outside in right field at Globe Life Field. And now I tried to, I let y'all have it. I let them have it on Thursday night because you know what? You celebrate a championship. You hadn't won one ever in franchise history. Celebrate it. No harm, no foul. But come on, man. We got to do better than that. Some were really thought that the hot thing to do was to put that thing on a huge white bed sheet and hang it over right field and think that was going to be suffice for a uh, World Series banner. Come on, man. My seven-year-old could have done better than that, and she probably would have given the opportunity. All I'm here to say is, look, man, if you're going to go Texas with this thing, the pomp and circumstance, I need the fireworks, pyrotechnics. I need all kinds of stuff. And then to give me that dull banner, okay, we, we got to do – I want the Rangers to win another one so they can have a do-over when it comes to the banner and then be able to have a little bit better of a one uh, when they win the 2024, if they're able to do so, which I would love to see because I got a hell of an offense, okay? Corey Seager is going to be a legitimate AL MVP candidate. Marcus Simeon, who finished third behind Corey Seager in second to Shohei Otani. By the way, real quick, the Los Angeles Dodgers are going to beat down everything in its way. If you saw what they did to the St. Louis Cardinals on opening day, and if that's a preview of what they're about to do to teams this year, they may win 115 games. Because I don't know how in the world Tyler, Tyler Glass now got the start for them. I don't know how anyone's going to stop that offense because guess what the Dodgers get to run out every single damn day with that lineup? It is Mookie Betts, who now plays shortstop. Okay, Mookie Betts. Shohei Otani 
and Freddie Freeman. Those three are your top three hitters in the Los Angeles Dodgers lineup, to which I say, how in the blue hell do you stand to stop any of that at all this upcoming season? I don't know how teams will do it, and neither did the St. Louis Cardinals on opening day. Mike Trout, shout out to him. He reminded us of who he was in the post Shohei Otani era, despite the fact that the only reminder that we had is that no matter how good Mike Trout has been, a team has been horrendous over the past decade, and the Angels lost again to the Baltimore Orioles, who legitimate Baltimore's legit this upcoming season. They got a young, talented quarter, Gunnar Henderson. Like they've got a lot of talent there. Corbin Burns going to be an AL Cy Young Award candidate in uh, in Baltimore. They got a lot of talent out there. Needless to say, the game of baseball, for the most part, is healthy, and that's what I love to see. No matter how much I bang on the Texas Rangers World Series banner, the overall point here is. Major League Baseball is fun again. It's healthy. There are plenty of stars in the game, whether it be Ella De La Cruz in Cincinnati with the Reds. Obviously, Juan Soto, who put on a hell of a show in his debut with the New York Yankees, throwing out a potential game-tying run in the game against the Houston Astros. The game of baseball appears to be back, and that's great. For those that don't know, I love the game of baseball. In fact, baseball was the first sport that I played. I played from the time I was five, so I was 18 years old. There's nothing like hope springing eternal for baseball fans. And the fact that baseball is as popular as it is, at least now, despite how much Rob Manfred we can't stand, baseball has a chance to continue its reemergence in the national conversation because the game is being moved much faster in terms of the pitch clock, the pace of play is much better, and obviously the tremendous athletes that we see, whether it be the Bobby Witt Juniors, the uh, what you call Aaron Judge for the New York Yankees, Shohei Otani, Mookie Betts, all these players that I named earlier, and oh, by the way, the Atlanta Braves and all the stars that they have with a dude who went 40-70 last year and Ronald Acuna Jr. Like They've got a lot of talent in Major League Baseball that's worth watching and should be worth watching as the season goes on. And for the Texas Rangers, they sit at the top of the mountaintop looking down on the rest of Major League Baseball saying, come try and come get it from us because last year we took it and won a World Series championship. And for Texas Rangers fans, I hope that they continue to bask in what was a tremendous season last year. And if it's any indication that uh, after what happened on opening day, they may be treated to another spectacular summer from this ball club. The question will be, can the Rangers get healthy with that pitching staff? The likes of Jacob deGrom and Max Scherzer hopefully coming back by the time we get to June and beyond to help this team make the kind of deep postseason run that they did last year. They let Jordan Montgomery go as Jordan Montgomery signed with the team that he lost to or beat, I should say, last year in the World Series as he joined the Arizona Diamondbacks on a one-year deal. And then, of course, there's that young 22-year-old phenom named Wyatt Lankford who's got all of Major League Baseball talking with the tremendous spring that he had my man got the Cubs so shook yes I know there was an open base but at the same time I like to think of it this way Cubs was so shook by Wyatt Langford they was like you know we're gonna put you on base don't 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 you even worry about it Rook we we see what you're doing out here we're gonna put you on base and gonna take our chances with somebody else Wyatt Langford is gonna be special got his first major league hit in the game as well against Chicago he's gonna be just fine going forward which should have everyone excited about the prospects of this team and for me personally excited for a summer of baseball because there's nothing like taking your family out to the ballpark getting a hot dog sitting there for a few innings having some real good conversation and enjoying the national pastime which seems like it's back in terms of its popularity but more importantly connecting with the younger generation because that's the thing that major baseball's had an issue with for the last several years connecting with the younger generation to get them to appreciate and love the game of baseball because if I ever have a son, uh, yeah, he's going to be playing baseball. Because if he can throw 95 miles an hour left-handed or can hit the ball 400 feet, you best believe he's going to be on a diamond playing the game of baseball. But at the same time, the love and the joy of the game and the appreciation of the game and the athletes that do play it, I hope that stays. Because baseball, as I said, is in a good place. And hopefully it will continue to be that way because there are tremendous stars, superstars in the game, even with the controversy of Shohei Otani and the gambling situation. Hopefully that will go away and hopefully nothing will come of that. 
But at the same time, everyone else, I'm looking forward to watching this season, particularly the Texas Rangers, who are your reigning World Series champions and got off to a good start by handling business. Shout out to Jonah Heim for getting some redemption in the game and walking it off for the Rangers against the Chicago Cubs. Can't wait to see what that championship looks like, ring looks like, because I've heard it looks incredible. So we'll see as the weekend goes on. But shout out to the Rangers, man, on their way to trying to defend their World Series championship, their first ever in franchise history. That'll do it for this episode of the Gray Area Podcast. Again, thank you so much for joining me here on today's show. Make sure you download and subscribe to the Gray Area wherever you get your podcasts for free. Give it a five-star rating and write a review for it while you're there. And you can like and comment on the video if you're watching this on my YouTube channel at Kevin Gray Sports. I'll be back on Monday to talk with you again here on the Gray Area Podcast. Until then, I'll talk to you later. Peace.